Okay, um, I'd like to say thanks to Vesna for um, giving her a talk on the work we've been doing during the secondment and an introduction to the Marincom project that we're, we're both part of. Um, uh, Kruhur actually gave, us, uh, gave me an introduction. I wasn't sure if that would be the case, so I had a slide up uh, giving an introduction of myself. Um, so I've been with Scott Renewables uh, around three years now, and my work there is focused on um, blade development and, and rotor development, taking the blade and rotor structures from the size you see on the right-hand side from the SR250 prototype up to the size of the SR2000 blades on the left there. Um, so the real culmination of this work um, is shown in the video on the right-hand side, which is me uh, christening the SR2000 blades after three years' hard work with a, with a dash of Highland Park Orkney whiskey. So let's see if I can get still to load. Mm. So I have all the PPE on in this case. <laughs> So that was, in, that was in May of this year at the, at the launch of the SR2000 tournament. Um, so just to give a quick overview of what I'd like to talk about, um, I'll give an introduction to Scott Renewable's tidal power, um, tell you some information about the SR2000 prototype that we've been working on, um, discuss in a bit more detail the challenges that we see in tidal turbine blade design, and uh, techniques that we can use to sort of reduce our design risk and improve future blades and then discuss uh, future projects in blade development. <coughs> um, Scott Renewables Tidal Power is headquartered in Kirkwall in Orkney. Um, it was founded in 2002 and uh, as a sort of spin out from research that was carried out at Perry Watt University into the feasibility of floating tidal turbines. Um, the company employs around 25 people and uh, has really led the development of floating tidal turbines from small tank testing scale through to scale model testing at sea and now to the world's largest tidal turbine prototype. Mm. Um, so yeah, the, to give you an idea of what our turbine looks like, um, this is an artist's impression of an SR2000 scale machine deployed as part of a two machine array um, at a tidal site. So you can see that the, we've got a horizontal floating hull that supports two uh, rotors on retractable legs and there's a, a four point catenary mooring system and mooring turret that allow the turbine to rotate to face the oncoming tide. Um, this is a video that was taken during, during the SR250 testing program and what it actually looks like is that the, tor the turbine is being towed at high speed by a, a vessel that is actually moored in place since the tide that's rushing, rushing past. Um, you can see the, uh, well, the, the floating structure supports all the power electronics and subsystems that are required for generating electricity and exporting it to the grid. And uh, yeah, this is a view of the rotors rotating underwater. <coughs> so uh, the design and development of the turbine has been done in-house by Scott Renewables by quite a small sort of dedicated team uh, who are also involved in the operations and testing of the machine. So we've got a good amount of feedback incorporated in our design cycle. So um, you might be questioning at this point, why bother developing a floating tidal, tur tidal turbine in the first place? And um, the real business case of Scott Renewables technology is that it allows us to um, install, uh, operate and maintain our turbine at l lower cost than our competitors. So um, each of the turbines pictured in the slide uh, all required um, expensive oil and gas heavy lift vessels for their installation. And it, they would require if they for sort of unplanned maintenance in the future. And, uh, we don't see the sort of um, this level of cost as sustainable in the industry. Mm. So the, the Scott Renewables turbine, by contrast, is a yeah, it's a floating structure. It's um, deployed using a low cost and small workboat compared to these larger vessels, and uh, it can be accessed for 
um, unplanned maintenance uh, at sea, or it can be brought back to the quayside for larger maintenance work. Mm -hmm. um, in addition to this, we've got uh, physics on our side, we believe, where there's, um, due to the, the sheer velocity distribution that's, that's seen in, in tidal sites, um, there's more energy in the upper reaches of the water column, which is demonstrated by the, the blue velocity profile and then the, the red energy profile. So being higher up in the water column allows us to access a better resource. So uh, support for the R&D work that we've done so far has been provided by a variety of um, private and public investment um, from the likes of Total, Fred Olson, um, ABB, and uh, Scottish Enterprise, and DP Energy, who are an Irish uh, renewable energy developer, joined as an investor in 2015. Mm -hmm. um, so this is the, the whole structure that I was attempting to throw whiskey on in the first slide, and um, it's uh, a two megawatt uh, tidal turbine, which was aimed to be our, yeah, our first prototype of this size. Um, it's a 64 meter long floating structure with two 16 meter megawatt rotors with a combined um, power output of two megawatts at 3.1 meters per second. Um, and I can tell you that near, nearly to the exact ton, it's 507 tons in weight and uh, that was subject of a sweepstake on launch day, of which I unfortunately didn't win. <coughs> um, talking in more detail about the rotors, uh, they're very slightly different. Uh, our rotors are slightly different in, in their design than those used by other tidal power developers. Um, we've gone for a twin-bladed rotor that's compatible with our um, leg retraction uh, system. Um, the blades don't pitch. They're, uh, they're fixed in position and our power, power regulation is done by, <laughs> by slowing the rotor down in uh, the same manner as a stall controlled wind turbine. Um, this gives the blades a slightly different design goal in that we choose airfoils which are compatible with um, kind of gentle stall characteristics rather than absolute maximum power and maximum lift. Um, the, the turbine has two rotors which operate in opposing directions, so uh, the turbine is balanced when it's operating. So there's one clockwise and one anti-clockwise rotor. Um, we use uh, GRP uh, glass fiber epoxy um, materials for the current rotor, which are a development from materials used in wind turbine blades and marine structures such as uh, boat hulls and, and yachts and that sort of thing. Um, the Parts are fabricated, are, are constructed using um, a low-cost resin infusion method at the moment, and then the, the parts are adhesively bonded together to create the final structure that you see in the picture. <coughs> so, um, based on the design methods that, that Vesna has talked you through, you might be asking yourselves, like, what, what's the big problem? Like, you, you've got established design methods and the materials are commonly used, engineering materials. Um, what's the problem? Like, uh, so <coughs> despite this, there's been a fairly wide experience of tidal turbine blade failure in, in industry. <coughs> so uh, if I was to talk through the what I see as challenges in the design and manufacture of tidal turbine blades, the main one is the severity of the environment in which the blades, uh, the turbines are operated. So like for like a uh, megawatt scale wind turbine rotor is much much larger than a tidal turbine blade rotor uh, sorry a tidal turbine rotor and uh, reacting similar structural loads through a more compact structure is uh, these sort of higher stresses and strains and makes the, the structural design more difficult um, in addition to this uh, sort of aerial view of the, the site at EMAC where we're aiming to deploy our mixed turbine is that uh, the conditions can be very unsteady in nature due to the influence of waves and turbulence. So uh, this can, yeah, this leads to extreme fatigue loadings uh, during the turbine's design life, which is uh, a, a real uh, challenge in terms of the materials that we use, um, and also a challenge in terms of uh, our, our modeling strategy and the way that we simulate the loads that we use in design. <coughs> 
So other challenges uh, involve uh, the materials and structural engineering that we we employ. Uh, I was giving this uh, talk in this sort of practice format, and uh, I was reminded that I should remind you guys that this is not one of our turbine blades on the on the left hand side. It's uh, just an example of the kind of complex failure modes, buckling and sort of tearing and quite nasty things that happen when composite structures fail. Um, so the yeah, the material side and the analysis and design of composite structures can be more challenging than other engineering materials. And part of that is due to the variability that composite materials show, that there's more uncertainty in the material properties uh, than, than other engineering materials. And on the right hand side, uh, I've shown um, small material coupons that were tested as part of the um, inputs to the design process of our current set of blades. So, I mean, they're all exactly the same material, but the way that they've failed and where they've failed on each specimen is slightly different. And that's um, something that we need to take into account during design. Mm -hmm. So, uh, like these design risk risks exist, and um, we want to do our best to avoid blade failure and provide reliable rotors for the first generation of tidal turbines that are for tidal turbines being tested. So um, one of the ways that we try and reduce our design risk is to design to industry uh, standards, which is um, not very glamorous, but there's, um, yeah, certifying bodies like DNBGL have a wide range of experience in um, design analysis, manufacture and testing of composite wind turbine blades and also offshore structures. So. Um, it's a sort of resource intensive process to write up all your design reports and have them checked by DNB or other, other um, certifying bodies, but it's a, a really valuable part of the process in avoiding blade failure. Mm -hmm. um, the next one would be that testing our turbine at large scale has got the potential to reduce the uncertainty in our simulation and load derivation. So uh, the current SR2000, which is pictured under tow here in Orkney, is, is really highly instrumented and there's more instrumentation in a single nacelle of this turbine than we had in the entire of the uh, previous prototype. And that includes uh, strain gauging, which is installed in the blades and operates using fibre optics, which um, can measure the blade bending loads during operation. And, and that work will help validate um, the simulation on the models that we use to predict those loads at, 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 at full scale, so no extrapolation. <clears throat> um, another technique that we would use is uh, what's pictured on the right here is the building block uh, or pyramid method of uh, structural testing where um, yeah, despite our best efforts predicting the strength of large complicated structures is very, dif very difficult and very difficult to predict accurately. So uh, the, the concept is that you do a large amount of testing on the, at low cost on the, the bottom of the pyramid, and that includes things like coupon testing, which were pictured on previous slides. And working your way up the pyramid, you may um, test critical design components, such as the root connection and the bolted joint between the blade structure and the rest of the turbine. And uh, at the very top of the pyramid is a full scale uh, load test which would be applied to uh, a fully assembled blade and uh, that's really the ultimate way of demonstrating the strength of a complicated structure uh, but it comes at sort of extremely high cost that uh, you need to build a, an, an extra blade and then there's the cost of setting up and running the test so um, mm -hmm. uh, moving on to the, the topic of fatigue which I, I mentioned earlier in the talk uh, it's a logistical challenge on top of uh, full-scale structural testing and uh, it's something which I think the, the sort of industry view is that it's going to be addressed before scale production of tidal turbine blades but developers uh, haven't quite got there yet so it's a, a problem for to be approached in future. Mm -hmm. So um, tying back into the, the marine comp side of the project, uh, the fatigue lifetime of the structures that we design and build are highly dependent on the material properties um, and two which are critical for tidal turbine blades are um, delamination and crack growth um, and the way that the material interacts with the water in operation so 
it can be seen that um, material properties degrade over time from tidal turbine blades which are immersed in water. Um, so the test on the right hand side is sort of deriving um, data on crack growth in composite materials used in wind turbine blades and incorporating that modeling, uh, that testing in models that we use um, as part of design and for fatigue lag prediction have got the potential to um, yeah, increase the accuracy of our models and, and bring down costs and additional material that we use in tidal turbine blades at the moment to cover things that we don't understand well. Um, so moving on to future projects for, for blade design at Scott Renewables. Um, it was announced in February of this year that we had been um, granted a proposal to design and develop a second two megawatt scale turbine um, with the goal of reducing the cost of energy by 25%. So this is a, a project that's led by Scott Renewables and it's um, with uh, an in, in industrial and academic partners. Um, we're aiming to develop our SO2000 Mark I into a second generation machine. But uh, as far as the blades are concerned, um, we're working with uh, Air Composites, um, our leading a project to reduce the cost of tidal turbine blades um, by applying methods that they've developed um, that use um, a new manufacturing route for um, composite structures. So we're a partner in that ourselves, Scott Renewables and uh, UCC in Ireland. Um, so that's going to be taking place over the next few years, starting quite soon. Mm -hmm. So thanks for your time. Thanks. Thanks. This production is brought to you by the University of Edinburgh.